lot of concerns associated with the CDC's prescribing guidelines in terms of both process and substance. The process concern is pretty large. In fact, to the point that they did not invite an awful lot of stakeholders. For example, they had an expert group in which the membership was unknown. They had a webinar um, to be able to get feedback about the prescribing guidelines. Um, however, that webinar had some technical difficulty associated with it, and um, they did not provide, the CDC did not provide in advance the actual draft of the prescribing guidelines. Only participants in the webinar could view them. They had a short period of time in which to respond to them. Uh, participants could ask questions, um, but they would not get any answers and they had essentially 25 hours after seeing the guidelines to respond to them. The CDC guidelines were, were developed by what I would consider a biased group of, of professionals uh, that were hand-selected by the CDC. It was done in a very secretive manner. There was no opportunity for input uh, by the community, which is required by law. Um, the second round, uh, there was some input allowed, but that input was only 24 hours versus weeks, which is usually allowed. Uh, a number of the people that were on the, the original panel uh, were people that were clearly aligned with uh, physicians for rational opioid prescribing who have been very clear to the community that they're anti-opioid. Um, so so the, the panel that, that developed these guidelines were biased, in, in my opinion. Uh, there was also a number of conflicts of interest that originally were not disclosed, and it was done behind closed doors. So I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to the C CDC developing guidelines for safety issues. I think that that's a smart thing to do, but you really need to have all the players at, at the table. Well, there are several challenges associated with the CDC prescribing guidelines. Although they are only guidelines and voluntary, and an awful lot of people have the potential to misinterpret that and think that they are binding, first of all. Second of all, an awful lot of policymakers at the state level and perhaps federal level are interested in adopting the CDC's guidelines because there's some deference to that particular agency. But the concern here is, is that those individuals, all these stakeholders were not invited to the table uh, during this process. And there were a lot of concerns about the stakeholders being shut out. So. Um, the, the problem that, that could be associated with that is that um, the, the, the reliance by the CDC, for example, on non-pharmacologic therapies is centrally that those alternative therapies may not be as effective as opioids, number one. Secondly, uh, those alternative treatments may not be covered by the individual patient's um, insurance coverage. And when you have a denial of coverage, you essentially have denial of care. One of my major concerns about the CDC guidelines, if we, if we split them down by the 12 different recommendations, is this recommendation about the, the morphine equivalent dose. To me, it, it's actually aggravating because it's based on pseudoscience. So for example, if we look at the, the simplest form of, of morphine equivalents, if you put a patient on 80 milligrams a day of oxycodone and one patient, let's say the patients are identical, except for one patient is 150 pounds and one patient is 300 pounds, right? So in the 300 pound patient, you basically gave them half the dose of the same dose because they're twice the weight. Um, that's the simplest way to think about it. But uh, more, more complex uh, patients differ uh, by, by pharmacogenetics or their genetic makeup. And so they have different enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing these drugs. Some drugs, some opioids are metabolized by one or more enzymes to a more active drug. That very same drug may have certain metabolites uh, that are converted to an inactive or a less active drug. So if you have one or more enzymes in a patient, patients have many enzymes, uh, a patient could be a very rapid metabolizer with one enzyme, a poor metabolizer of another enzyme. So if you have one patient that met rapidly metabolizes a drug, patient that rapidly metabolizes a drug to a more active form, then they probably will need a lesser dose. If you have a patient that is a poor metabolizer to the active dosage form, then, then it's going to be the opposite. Another issue we have is that many pain patients are on multiple medications. 
And so they may be on a medication that inhibits one of those enzymes or that induces the liver to make more enzymes. So even in the absence of a phenotype difference, in the absence of a weight difference, we also have drug interaction. So there are three factors alone that could affect the morphine equivalent dose. And if we can get past all of that stuff, there's no universally accepted morphine equivalent dose. So if you were to go online and try and convert one opioid to another and look at five different opioid conversion calculators, you may get five different answers. For the past several years, uh, several states have adopted guidelines or rules, there's a distinction, concerning dosage. And it is in the term of a dosage threshold. Once a particular dosage threshold is reached, then it oftentimes triggers a recommendation or an action by the prescriber. Of course, these particular dosage thresholds um, are just that, thresholds. They're not ceilings, and um, at least in many states. And, but many states and many prescribers may interpret them as ceilings and tell their patients that, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, prescribe above this amount, when in fact that is not the case. This concern about dosage thresholds um, and the use of that in any type of public policy as a trigger um, can actually be uh, potentially dangerous in terms of morbidity and mortality. Uh, and even from state to state, within those thresholds, some states have their own opioid calculators and they're in disagreement with each other. There are other issues, uh, for example, one of the guidelines talks about uh, that you need to see some kind of functional improvement to keep the patient on the opioids. Well, you're not going to see a functional improvement in a Parkinson's patient. You, you, don't, want, you don't want to see a patient uh, deteriorate this to, as quickly as they might otherwise. So if you put a patient on an opioid, for example, that's got Parkinson's disease or arachnoiditis or some kind of disease that's going to get worse over time, you just don't want to see them diminish as quickly, but you're not going to improve function, right? So the, but the way the guidelines are written, they're saying, well, you know, you, you need just to show, show a functional improvement to continue the opioids, and that can't possibly be in some patients that are legitimate people for opioid therapy. Pain is individualized, and the number one thing to consider, whether it be opioids or non-opioids, is what is in the best interest of the patient. And at times, opioid um, therapy, at least today, is under a great deal of scrutiny. And the pendulum is clearly swinging away um, from uh, patient-centered care as it, as it relates to opioids. And I think several years down the line, people will look back and realize that maybe we went a bit too far. And so there's an awful lot of people in the pain community saying you're going too far as it is. And so ultimately what we want is balance is that how can we ensure access to appropriate opioid therapy or other alternative treatments and ensure that they are actually paid for? Well, at the same time, prevent abuse. And that's a challenge among policymakers, and prescribers, as well as patients. I think it would be wonderful if the CDC uh, worked with a group of, of professionals uh, that, that was interdisciplinary. Um, and to come up with guidelines that, that were reasonable. And not all of the guidelines are, are unreasonable. Uh, there's at least two that I, that I agree with. <laughs> have some pharmacists that really understand the pharmacogenetics. Have a pharmacist that spends a lot of time doing pain management. So they really need a, a panel of people um, that have, from different walks of, of life and probably even non-clinicians, really. Uh, it would be good to have some patient uh, advocates on, on that panel, you would need a, psych, a psychologist that does pain management. That's important because they understand the world of those people. Um, to have primary care, to have a nurse practitioner, to have a nurse, all right? Um, to have a nurse, to have a, a, a PA. There are a few practices, very, very few, but I could probably count them on two hands of who has a clinical pharmacist in, in their practice. I see that as a problem. If the government wanted to do something, they would fast track that through Congress and say, you know what, let's put pharmacists into these clinics and let them get paid to do what they do best and are happy doing. I mean, that's what we do. So that to me is, you know, that would be wonderful. It'll be quite a while, I think, before we find an equilibrium and it's, it's an ongoing battle because um, addiction, uh, opioid abuse disorder is a moving target. And so uh, what we ultimately want is more effective, more safer alternatives, perhaps, and um, that um, are cost-effective and uh, will ultimately help uh, the people in pain.